Very good. So I'm just going to try to run through a real quick summary of, of the uh, the key findings of the report and why why we set out to do this research. Um, so to start with, uh, one, one of the reasons that sort of prompted us to really do this work was that Alberta actually burns more coal than the rest of Canada combined. Uh, but it, it, but a lot of Albertans actually don't know that uh, most of our electricity comes from coal. And in fact, there was a recent s survey done on energy literacy by the University of Calgary, which found that only one in three Albertans realized that coal was the predominant source of electricity here. And so we thought it was important um, to be shedding some light uh, on, on, on an issue that uh, ha has uh, air quality impacts as well as major greenhouse gas emission impacts in the province. Um, so what, right now, our per the percentage of uh, electricity that comes from coal is about two-thirds. Um, that percentage is slowly shrinking as our overall electricity demand is growing. Uh, but in fact, between 2002 and 2012, uh, the actual installed coal capacity in the province grew by 14%. So while the proportion is shrinking, uh, we're actually burning more and more coal every year. Um, most of those plants uh, are located upwind of Edmonton, uh, but there's also a, a few plants, uh, one near Grand Cache, uh, one uh, and a few just east of Red Deer and Calgary. Um, so we set out, uh, well, I guess one of the other, uh, another important issue that sort of precipitated this work was that the federal government has recently introduced greenhouse gas regulations uh, on coal plants, sort of recognizing uh, the huge amount of greenhouse gases that comes out of these plants. Uh, so to their credit, the one, the one strong uh, aspect of these federal regulations uh, will be that they won't allow new, any new coal plant to be built, sort of a, any new conventional coal plant to be built uh, without carbon capture and storage. And so that's, that's a good thing because that's sort of going to stem the tide of these really uh, highly greenhouse gas intensive plants. Um, but the weak, one of the weaker points of the, of the regulations is that it allows all existing plants to run out until they're 50 years old, until they're half a century, uh, until they've reached sort of their 50th birthday before they have to comply with these regulations. And so what that means is, is all the, this is sort of our existing fleet of coal plants, and you can see that um, it, it does mean we're going to be dealing with, with this suite of plants or this host of plants uh, in the province for decades to come. And so it's important to shed light on the emissions that are coming out of those plants and what that means for all of us living here in Alberta. Uh, in fact, the, the federal regulations would allow the last, coal, the last sort of conventional coal plant to be operating up until 2062. So what we did is we set, we set out on some work that had been done. Uh, we, we based, I guess, our work on previous studies. There's been, there has been a fair bit of work looking at um, these types of issues in Europe as well as the United States as well as in Ontario. And so there's, there is a host of literature out there looking at all the different types of emissions that come from coal plants. Uh, and, and also looking at the National Pollution uh, Inventory, uh, you, you can see the, the, the volume of emissions that are coming from the coal plants uh, in Alberta. It's 33% of the sulfur dioxide, 10% uh, uh, of the nitrogen oxides, and 44% uh, of the airborne mercury all come from the coal plants. So significant, uh, significant pollutants and, and of various uh, levels of toxicity. So there was a couple of different areas that uh, it, it's, it's difficult to do these types of studies to be looking at uh, hosts of different types of pollutants and figuring out what long-term health effects are. And so we, we, we used several different uh, studies that all sort of ended up pointing in the same direction. Uh, and the one, the one area we actually looked at was looking at those federal regulations themselves from the federal government. Um, and what they, what, what they had estimated was that when their regulations come into place and sort of when those plants hit 50 years old, um, they, they estimated the, the health damages that would be uh, uh, avoided or, uh, as a result of those regulations. So these are numbers actually from Environment Canada itself uh, that, that estimated sort of over the first um, 20 years of their regulations, they would be the health savings in Alberta uh, are 2.7 billion dollars over those 20 years. Uh, and so if you if you take the um, if you take that number and divide it by the amount of uh, electricity, oh. electricity from coal those regulations will ultimately avoid, it comes out to about 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour of actual damages uh, that, uh, that would be uh, health, health impacts, I guess. And so, that, so that, that was a starting point for us, and that was a number from Environment Canada itself. So I'm going to hand it over to Farah to, to, to uh, continue the discussion. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I'm just going to continue to talk a little bit about uh, the, the modeling that we used in the report. 
As Tim mentioned, we used three different models, and the second one was uh, something that was developed for the Canadian Medical Association, um, a very trustworthy uh, organization, and I would say one of the leaders um, on, uh, you know, health knowledge in this country. Um, in 2008, the CMA uh, released their own report looking at the um, the cost of air pollution all across Canada, and it's the modeling that they used in that study that we. Um, uh, that, that we adopted for, for this report on coal. Uh, we scaled it back a bit to look at the population in Alberta uh, and also just to look at the pollutants coming from Alberta's coal plants, and that's how we came up with the numbers. Um, we looked at both uh, acute as well as long-term health impacts, and we found that um, the pollutants from coal plants were resulting in over 4,000 asthma symptom days per year over 700 emergency room visits per year, um, which, you know, as health organizations, those are pretty alarming numbers and uh, we're, we're very concerned about them. Um, the third model that we looked at is uh, something that was um, used in the United States that looked at healthcare cost and damages per ton of emissions. and. Um, that model gave even higher numbers than what we came up with using the CMA model, uh, and we think that's because the population density around the coal plants in the U.S. is, is much higher than it is in, in Alberta. Um, but what's important to note is that all of the three um, studies that we looked at are all pointing us in the same direction, and, uh, and that is that there is a very noticeable health cost associated with burning coal in this province. Another part of the report deals with climate change as a health issue. Uh, as a doctor's organization, CAPE, and I'm sure a lot of the health groups that are involved here today, would agree that we're very concerned about the increasing health impacts of climate change. Um, one of the world's most respected uh, peer-reviewed journals, medical journals, The Lancet, said in 2009 that climate change could be the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So when, when our very respected medical journals are, are giving us this kind of information, uh, it makes us listen. Um, and the World Health Organization has, has put a number to, uh, to the cost associated with climate change, and they say that by 2030, the direct cost to health um, is expected to be between two and four billion dollars U.S. per year. Um, so when, when uh, we're talking about the health impacts of climate change, it includes things that um, increase medical risks, risks of new pests and diseases, heat exhaustion, Cardiovascular and respiratory disease from more frequent and severe heat waves, um, and if you if you take a look at the graph up on the screen right now, it's very surprising to see that the greenhouse gas emissions from coal are on par with the greenhouse gas emissions from the oil sands, um, which is quite a startling stati statistic. Uh, we thought it made sense to to break it down um, in terms of cost per kilowatt hour, so we um, have a a good reference point. So just going down the list that's up on the screen now, the first, the first numbers uh, in the table look at the social cost of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the second line down looks at the, um, the economic damages from health impacts from air pollution. What isn't calculated, and I think it's important to put out, is the environmental impacts and the costs associated with those, which would, which would increase the numbers. Even with the conservative estimates that we've done here, we found that the real cost of coal, when you take into account all of the health impacts, would be at least 50 percent more than the current market value. Um, so I guess the, the, the underlying message here is that burning coal is not as cheap as we think it is. And um, we really want the health costs to be factored in. We have two recommendations to put forward in this report. For the first is that we want to make sure that the, the um, health costs of coal, of coal are accounted for, because if they're not, then renewable energy technologies are at a disadvantage. Um, as the title of the report suggests, um, you know, Albertans are basically subsidizing the coal industry with their own health, and we see that as, as a problem. Tim mentioned that the federal coal regulations that were released last year will allow coal plants to keep polluting until their 50th birthday. And again, we, we, we see that as a, as a big problem. That timeline is, is certainly not uh, acceptable from a health perspective. And we see an opportunity here for Alberta to do better. Um, because uh, st uh, more stringent greenhouse gas reduction targets for coal will prevent illness in the longer term. And uh, that's all we've had f we have prepared for this uh, <coughs> slide deck, but I'm going to pass it over to Rob Oliphant from the Asthma Society to say a few words. Thanks, Farron. Um, it's good to be in Alberta. Uh, my name is Rob Oliphant, and um, 
like the Hair Club for Men, I'm not only the president of the Asthma Society, but I'm a person with <laughs> asthma as well. And um, our goal in the Asthma Society of Canada is to help people live with their asthma and control their asthma so their asthma doesn't <coughs> control them. That is our ultimate goal. And uh, there are many things that we can do uh, to work with people with uh, asthma to help them, and that is help them manage their triggers, be on the right medications. But there are certain things that are beyond the control of people with asthma, and that has to do with the air that we breathe. Uh, people can choose the water they drink. They can choose the rooms they enter. They can choose the food they eat and manage many things in their health that way. We can't choose the air we breathe. And so uh, as part of our uh, mandate, <coughs> it is to look at the environmental factors that exacerbate asthma and asthma conditions in Canada and one of the largest ones has to do with air quality. Now we were in Alberta as a society last year extensively uh, promoting the Air Quality Health Index, the AQHI, which is a, um, uh, a federal uh, mandated program that is now active in many provinces to help people, like people with asthma, manage their illness by changing their activities based on the Air Quality Health Index readings. My concern about that, and we will be promoting that and we support it, is that that is part of a general trend in society to shift responsibility solely to the individual away from the community. And what this report is, it reminds the community that we are in this activity together, that everyone's respiratory health is the responsibility of government, of community, of health agencies, of health professionals, health care providers, and health charities. And so our goal here, um, when um, uh, CAPE uh, met with us, and we've been working on this project in, in Ontario and in other projects across the country on other issues. Um, we knew that the, the next big issue in Canada around air quality has to do with coal-produced uh, electricity in Alberta. Um, as Tim said, there's more uh, coal being used in Alberta than in the rest of the country put together. And that's very frankly practical. It's because the coal is here. <coughs> there is coal, and we understand. Um, the apparent or perceived uh, uh, inexpensive nature of coal for Alberta. What this report does is it puts the real cost of coal-fired, uh, 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 produced energy into the mix, into the public discussion. Because it's too easy to, to put energy costs here as direct energy costs and then complain about uh, exploding health costs. And what we're doing is saying, to have a real understanding of the economics of health and the economics of energy, those questions have to be put together into one formula. And we've looked at three models and have a very conservative, we're in Alberta, a very conservative estimate of the true cost of electricity. Uh, we have not padded it in any way. Uh, I've got plus signs all the way through my copy where we can look at other costs that are too hard to, to prove um, with evidence, but what this has done is taken our intuitive understanding of the effect of, of the emissions from the direct coal uh, production, and not just upstream and not further downstream, but the actual cost of the energy that is being produced in terms of our health care. And that has to do with the fact that very few people follow asthma. Uh, the reality is that asthma is the number one cause across country in every jurisdiction for children's visits to emergency departments. ED <coughs> visits are directly related to asthma. It is uh, uh, the number two reason for hospital admissions of children <coughs> in Canada. It is uh, a leading cause that the actual financial burden of respiratory illness is huge. Uh, and this report just, just touches on parts of that. It has to do with asthma, emphysema, COPD, lung cancer. Many environmental factors go into this whole mix and uh, we want to engage uh, Albertans in a good discussion about how we manage our health and how we manage our costs. So this is both a health argument and an economic argument, and it's meant to, to, uh, to challenge, yes, the, uh, the decision makers, but it's also to encourage them um, to look at ways that Alberta can lead the world on reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and improving other uh, things such as particulate matter for the population in Alberta. 
And this is, uh, maybe there's, it's not no surprise that uh, there is an attention right now on Alberta about greenhouse gases. That is there. This is a realizable, practical, um, relatively easy solution to, to building the reputation of Alberta as a, as a progressive province um, fighting both climate change and improving the health of Albertans. Um, I want to end up by thanking uh, the Pemina Institute for, for the work. Uh, the reality is uh, we as, as health charities or physicians for the environment, the Lung Association, it, we do not have the capacity on our own to do this kind of, of, of work to, to produce a 75 page report that is um, uh, going to be a model for reports not only in Canada but in other parts of the world where uh, we work in uh, coalition with uh, health charities around the world on this issue. And uh, this report will be, uh, um, will be of international use. And so we, we thank uh, them for their, um, their tenacity and their intelligence and their, um, their hard work. And now we hand it over to the Lung Association. Yes, so I'll just have a couple of quick words here. So uh, again, I'm Beth Nanny with the Lung Association and the Environmental Program Specialist. Uh, so the Lung Association Alberta and Northwest Territories is pleased to join our fellow health and environmental organizations to draw attention to the issue of coal-fired power in Alberta. Uh, the health costs from coal power can no longer be overlooked and Albertans need to stop paying for conventional coal-fired electricity with their health. Coal plants are a major source of air pollution and the health effects from coal are many. Air pollution from coal is linked to respiratory conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, uh, asthma, lung cancer, and pneumonia. It can increase the chance of respiratory illness by lowering resistance to infection, and exposure to fine particulate matter, which is a significant, <coughs> significant pollutant from coal emissions, is known to affect lung development in children. In an effort to protect the health of Albertans, we urge the Alberta government to encourage the transition away from coal power towards renewable energy. Alberta has the opportunity to go further than the federal regulations that allow coal units to operate for 50 years. We strongly encourage industry to transition out of coal power sooner and invest in renewable alternatives. The Lung Association believes that breathing matters. Protecting the lung health of all Albertans should be top priority. Cleaner air means fewer children being rushed to emergency rooms with asthma attacks and fewer adults hospitalized due to COPD flare-ups. Cleaner air means better health for everyone, particularly for the 600,000 Albertans living with lung disease. Now you didn't give the best line from the Lung Association. If you can't breathe, nothing, nothing else matters. matters. <laughs> That's true. I think they have a trademark, but we use it as well. It's, it's their line. If you can't breathe, nothing, nothing else matters. matters. Think about it. That's true. So. Well, thank you everyone for, for uh, your presentation.